Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our conference celebrating Midge Dector's enduring impact. Please welcome Dr. Kevin Roberts, president of the Heritage Foundation. Thank you. Good afternoon. It's great to see those of you here in the in-person audience and, of course, grateful to our friends at C-SPAN for being here and broadcasting this. And, of course, we're in for a great treat. This conference is going to do a wonderful job commemorating the life and the work of our longtime friend and board member, Mitch Decker. And as I've been thinking about this day and preparing for it, rereading some of her work, in particular some speeches that she gave at Heritage events over the years, it, it struck me, something that's probably self-evident to those of you who knew her well, especially those of you who are family, that what Heritage does every day is, is sustained by this spirit of Midge. In particular, something struck me this morning, which is her constant theme of American conservatism, but really American principles as, as they are worked on here at Heritage being an inheritance from previous generations. This, among many other things, is the spirit of conservatism. And so you're going to get a lot of evidence of that in today's panels, and we're so grateful to have with us many additional luminaries in the conservative movement, all of them friends to Heritage and, and to me personally. And so it's my job to kick us off. And you know, the best part of kicking things off, especially when you have another luminary who's following you to really kick things off, is to introduce that person and then get out of the way. And so I will, I will be back with you at the end of the conference and, and in and out during the conference, out occasionally only because there, there are these conversations happening across the street about a debt ceiling deal and Heritage is very immersed in those as, as we should be, trying to make that deal as good as we can. But all of that to say, it is both an, an honor, or it is an honor both to talk about Midge briefly, but always to introduce my friend and my mentor and a longtime board member and founder of the Heritage Foundation, Dr. Ed Fulner. Thank you very much, Dr. Roberts. It's a great pleasure to be here and to talk about our, our wonderful late colleague, Midge Dector. 1981, Ronald Reagan, newly in the White House, Heritage Foundation decided we're a conservative organization. We really need to get a neocon on our board. We talked about it at the board rather discreetly, and we came up with a list of uh, prospective members. The list consisted of one person, Midge Dector. She, she was, in fact, the acknowledged first lady of neoconservatism and one of the most influential social critics of her times. We wanted the moral clarity that Midge brought to the cultural issues uh, that were confronting the United States. I mean, who else but Midge Dector would say, uh, the core of affirmative action and its presumption of guilt is a lot of baloney. Yeah. Uh, or if we're talking about 13 and 14 year olds having babies, the answer is stop sleeping around. Uh, Midge had these absolute clear uh, definitions of, of how to deal with things. We wanted to keep her, we wanted her deep understanding of the ongoing global war between the free world and the communist world. We needed her on our board. I first met Midge in my office at the Heritage Townhouse Complex on Stanton Square, about two blocks from here, uh, right on Capitol Hill. I learned early on that Midge Dector had a common sense approach to issues that was very different from the conservatives I'd been associating with. A William Buckley, who was born to mingle with the elites, or a Russell Kirk, who was born to be an intellectual hermit in the splendid isolation of Macosta, Michigan. Midge, on her side, tried, tied her insights to the concrete realities of the world, not only her 
growing up space in Minnesota, but her adopted city of New York. Motherhood, marriage, family, work. She was a pragmatist willing to accept 70% of what she wanted to achieve and come back for the other 30% sometime later. She was grateful not to let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Over the years, she gave me the benefit of her shared advice on how rifts between conservatives could be healed. I vividly remember a whole series of encounters we had in our building next door in the early 1980s when neoconservatives, traditional conservatives, the new right, and even the occasional libertarian would come together to try and understand each other better. Whenever Midge was in charge of those sessions, she began the discussion by emphasizing the issues that united us rather than the issues that divided us. She happily accepted our invitation to join the board early on, explaining that far from finding us to be scary right-wing radicals, as depicted by many of her New York liberal friends, she found that us to be, quote, the most uncynical, open-hearted people she had ever run into. I love that open-hearted, uncynical. Mids liked to tell the story about her first meeting with Paul Weirich, co-founder of the Heritage Foundation, and our mutual friend Phyllis Schlafly, the organizing genius of the Eagle Forum, which in the 70s and early 80s blocked ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. To the surprise of many, Midge and Phyllis got along instantly because they realized they were allies in the epic battle against the counterculture. When someone asked Midge how she could be so friendly with a right winger like Phyllis Schlafly, she replied, quote, it's easy. She's been doing our dirty work for years. <laughs> we wanted Midge on the Heritage Board for many reasons. Among them was her candid critique of communism of, excuse me, of feminism first, of feminism. Radical feminism, Midge said, was not a demand for freedom, but rather a form of escape from freedom. Feminism does not embrace responsibility, she said. It evades responsibility with its talk of victimization and demands for special treatment. Midge was especially critical of quotas in all the major areas of life, such as work, sex, marriage, motherhood, she said, feminists created arrangements that helped them evade all responsibility. Her critique of feminism led her inevitably to a strong defense of family. The woman's movement, she charged, depicts marriage as enslavement that produces a pervasive antinatalism that is fatal for a society because there is no adequate alternative to the family. The basic problem, Midge said, is that too many no longer ac accept the fundamental difference and the fundamental natures of men and women. Midge wrote that four decades ago. How prescient was her analysis when we consider the deadly wokeism that infects our society and particularly our schools these days. Midge also applied the concept of freedom and responsibility in the conduct of US foreign policy. At the height of the Cold War, she was le a leading advocate for a strong national defense, second to none. She was a critic of Nixon's detente and Carter's appeasement of Brezhnev. She left her job as senior editor at Basic Books to found the Committee for the Free World that criticized lopsided arms treaties and the support and supported the anti-communist movements like the Contras in Nicaragua. With the end of the Cold War, Midge dissolved the committee but continued to speak out against communism and other tyrannies. She began participating early on in the soirees of the Philadelphia Society, the premier intellectual gathering of the traditional fusionist conservative movement founded by Bill Buckley and Milton Friedman. Somewhere along the line, perhaps as a result of heritage trustee meetings and dinners and those soirees of the Philadelphia Society, Midge dropped the neo 
and simply identified herself as a conservative. And those of us who had proudly founded the Philadelphia Society appreciated her insights, her stand on all the public policy issues we cared about, all the principles that united us, and we elected her president of our Philadelphia Society. She became an essential bridge among the various strands of conservatism. She addressed perhaps the most difficult of all questions for conservatives. Is a united conservative movement possible in today's divided America? For nearly five decades, Soviet communism was the enemy that united conservatives. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, could conservatives truly be preserved as a single movement? What are we, Midge asked. Are we a group of friends, a family, or are we a long, sour marriage held together for the kids and now facing an empty nest? Midge concluded that we're a family, but it was a different set of challenges that characterized that we characterized during the Cold War. We needed now to face the challenge of smug, lazy, ignorant misreporting by the media. That's 25 years ago. Uh, the challenge of so-called enlightened education that leaves children's in, children in ignorance. The challenge of a cultural elite that is actively undermining the ideas of culture that matter. The challenge of racism enlightened by affirmative action and anti-culturalism. All these challenges, Midge said, Mid said, are expressions of a culture war that is as serious as any other war our country has ever faced. The war is not just a battle on policy, although policy is involved, but rather a struggle about matters of the spirit. How fortunate heritage was to have such a wise person as a trustee. How fortunate the conservative movement was to have so eloquent an advocate for freedom. How blessed America was to have so inspiring an example of a truly free woman. In her 1994 Erasmus lecture, Midge outlined two essential conservative beliefs the taking of responsibility for what one does and what one is, and a belief in God. And what, what is it that he wants us to do, to choose life, to be fruitful and multiply, and to walk in his ways? Such a commitment, Midge said, requires us to renounce the arrogant rejection of God's word world of many, many liberals call idealism. It obliges us to focus on what brings us together and what we have in common. The rediscovery of God, Midge said, quote, was more like a long climb up a steep hill than a flash of lightning. If we persevere, as Midge might put it, it will lead us to a life worth living and a society and a nation worth preserving. Thank you, Midge Dector, friend and mentor to so many of us. Oh, Jay. <laughs> Sorry. I'm hey, Richard, Ed was supposed to introduce me, so that was why the pause was. <laughs> so it is a delight for me to be a part of this panel and also a, a bit daunting. Um, I did not know Midge, but I knew her work. And I guess but just simply because of the, the generation in which I lived, I, I mainly knew her through first things, actually. Um, and of course, for I will say for the, the uh, millennials in Gen Z, when they hear the word neoconservatism because of say the last 25 years of foreign policy, people very often associate neoconservatism with a particular take on foreign policy. And so this is the kind of myth that's emerged um, that the neoconservative were people who were on the left, uh, but they decided communism was bad, and so they broke with the left over that particular thing, but were basically liberals otherwise. Um, and certainly if Midge Dector is any, uh, it, it, um, 
instance of this, uh, she clearly refutes that stereotype. And as Ed said, she eventually actually dropped the Neo. Uh, and so I took that to mean I had remembered reading her uh, obituary in the New York Times when it came out saying this, that she eventually dropped the Neo. And so the implication would be perhaps that she became more of a sort of cultural conservative over time. And yet, if you look at her cultural analysis uh, going back well over 40 years, she was a trenchant critic of the left-wing attack on the family in general and on feminism in particular. Um, and my work here at the Heritage Foundation at the moment, um, simply by necessity, is focused on the madness of gender ideology, on this idea that children can be born in the wrong body, that uh, there aren't fundamental differences at the biological level between males and females. Well, this is, in, in, at least in part, an implication and an outworking of the radical nature of the sexual revolution, plus some complicated things having to do with critical theory and postmodernism and all that kind of stuff, right? But even those of us that were predict predicting the implications of the sexual revolution didn't necessarily anticipate, even five or 10 years ago, that it would lead to the sterilization of children. That's sort of a surprise to everyone. And so when I started reading Midge's work uh, on the family and on feminism over the last few weeks in preparation for this, I thought, I wonder if she said anything uh, that would anticipate where we are today. And so rather than sort of analyzing her work, what I'd like to do um, is simply read a quote from you from an essay that she wrote in 1981. So the spring of 1981, this was published in Policy Review, which was a, a publication of the Heritage Foundation for many years, um, and about feminism, very specifically. Now, this is interesting because, remember, feminism and in, in gender ideology are now in, it, we're in a sort of weird moment. Um, one could argue that there's an aspect of some feminist thought that led to gender ideology. Judith Butler, for instance, this idea that to be a woman both as sex and gender is a mere performance, right, sort of is one of the tributes theories of gender ideology. At the same time, feminism as a movement is at war with itself. And it is the so-called radical feminists that believe that men and women are real. And the mainstream feminists that seem not to. That's how strange this moment is in which we live. And so that's something that, um, that feminism as a movement is going to have to assess for itself. But Midge Decker was writing things in 1981 that I think anticipated this. So let me read just a portion of this text. So remember, this is 1981. This wasn't written last week, and I haven't, I haven't edited it. In the second era for which the movement has provided a theory of women's victimization, namely marriage, the theory that is feminism is hardly less grim. Marriage, the movement has told its constituents, is merely an arrangement created by men for the provision of cheap labor and free sex. The contribution of women to that arrangement, therefore, is nothing more than a form of slavery, or at best, indentured servitude. And she goes on and then continues, equality can only be established in marriage under this thinking when that institution has been redefined. Redefinition is, in general, the movement's mystical Kabbalistic process for hastening the arrival or the second coming of the Messiah. Thus, husband and wife can only become equals in the movement's vision of equality when marriage has been redefined as a relationship in which there is no exchange. That is to say, in current fashionable parlance, when neither party to the marriage has a separate distinguishable role to play in the life of the other. Translated into plain English, what this boils down to is that the only kind of marriage not demeaning to women is one in which the woman, too, will be entitled to have a wife, without the same time having to be a husband. All right, let that just sit with you for a moment in 2023. She saw the implications like a prophet of where things were going. And so I commend this, especially to those of you who are millennials or Gen Zers. Uh, Google Midge Dector and feminism and read the wisdom that will pour forth. So I want to introduce our two other panelists and let them have the lion's share of the sort of discussion this afternoon. And notice that we're starting with culture this afternoon, because in fact, that was a key part of both her corpus and her thinking. So Abby Schachter here to my left um, is um, at Carnegie Mellon 
University, and I would ask her to speak first, and then longtime friend uh, Bob Woodson is over here to my left. And Bob is the founder and president of the Woodson Center. And in previous incarnations, Bob and I actually did a traveling road show to Christian colleges for the Heritage Foundation about a decade ago. So it's good to see you. So Abby, why don't you start start with some opening remarks um, uh, of what you like to reflect on Midge's work on culture and family. Sure, thank you very much, Jay. And um, I really wanna thank the Heritage Foundation um, for uh, putting on this event. It's really easy for me to be here because I'm here to talk about family. And since I'm going to boldly claim that uh, Midge was part of my family and I was honored to be part of her family, um, I have a very easy job. Um, I loved Midge, and I love her whole family, and um, it was a gift from my mother, um, Ruth Weiss, that I um, got to be part of the um, Midge and Norman's family, and so it's really my honor to be here and be able to speak about her. Um, I think that one of the amazing things about Midge uh, is that she spoke about her personal experience and then could um, broaden her view um, on the culture at large, just as you were saying earlier. Um, and going back and reading much of what she had to say about the family um, led me to have um, the following question. Um, as, as both uh, you and Dr. Fulner said before, um, Midge spoke about issues of the American family um, many, many decades before now, and, res and it all resonates now. So my question is as follows, is it a comfort that Midge says what she says about raising kids in an age when you set your family against the prevailing culture? Is it a comfort that that's a problem of longstanding, right? Um, were the drugs, the psych wards, the communes, the cults, and the illegitimate babies that she describes from her experience of raising children, were they worse than the scourge of social media, smartphones, marijuana, depression, anxiety, childlessness, loneliness? Um, I would say that we're continuing her fight because um, just as she defined and um, identified um, the start of the attack on what she called the American nervous system to 1965, we are really engaged in that uh, battle to this day. She said of her first marriage that all of her circle of friends and neighbors were sworn to bringing up children more liberally than she had been brought, than she had been brought up. Um, but very quickly realized that that was a road to dangerous uh, outcomes. And, and the, um, the freedom that emerged from the age in which she raised her children um, was in fact the burden that she spoke about most effectively, namely that um, all revolutions, the need to change, the idea that change was itself the most important thing led to um, the rejection and the denial of the importance of taking responsibility, of the need for traditions. And I think that this is one of the ways in which we must learn from what she wrote and keep it pushing it forward. Um, we are, um, as you described so aptly, in a very strange time now with regards to, to these questions. And I look forward to talking about more of what she had to say. 
Terrific. Thanks so much, Abby. So, Bob, you mentioned to me um, cryptically, and I don't even know the answer to the question, but you mentioned that that Midge taught you something or impressed upon you something that you still remember way back in 1977. Yeah, I mean, uh, when uh, Midge and I had traveled the same road uh, from liberal democratic uh, leading civil rights demonstration till I got bugged by reality mm. and the transition. What attracted me to, this, to the conservative movement, I came in about 76 into the American Enterprise Institute, is I met Paul Warwick. And um, what I was impressed with is the, is the willingness of conservatives to be self-critical. Dr. King said the highest form of maturity is the ability to be self-critical mm. and also to have moral clarity. And uh, what impressed me, I think, was when Paul Warwick uh, took a position against the uh, elevation of John Tower uh, to, to defense secretary. He took a lot of heat from the, Demo from the Republican Party and also from conservatives. And so, and Midge was in that, sort of in that vein, that she was willing to uh, challenge conventional wisdom even when it was inconvenient to her mm. and to challenge them. You mentioned uh, her attack on feminism, but what uh, uh, inspired me most is in her column, lengthy column and commentary in 1977 in response to the New York riots. Um, she was one of the few uh, non-guilty white women willing to tell the truth on race and poverty. And that's what impressed me. She argued that liberalism enabled the 1977 riots in New York during the city while blackouts became uh, treats, young black men were obviously incapable of responsible moral behavior due to the experience of oppressive racism. This is what the left argued. Young blacks were getting the message from liberal culture that they are inherently and by virtue of their race inferior, therefore virtually no crimes um, they commit. Uh, that someone of great influence does not rush to excuse on the grounds that they have no right to expect anything else. Um, moreover, there is virtually no traditional form of manliness following one's children, defending one's woman, that is not considered a cruel and bigoted demand to make on them, given the difficulties it would have to bring upon them. I mean, that was pretty raw stuff for her to say in 1977. And um, I, uh, when she wrote it, I uh, called her and commended her for it. And in fact, I'm about to do a column based upon this to publish today because the, the wisdom and insight that she expressed then certainly is needed today. And, and Midge was a person who um, understood uh, the, the limits of, 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 of liberal bigotry the bigotry of low expectations. This is what's destroying this nation, that progressives are using the rich tradition of the civil rights mo movement as a bludgeon against the fundamental values of this country, quickly migrating from justice for blacks to burning the flags and burning the Bible uh, and tearing this country apart. Um, and, and Midge stood with us. But Midge also stood with us in, in saying to the conservative movement, we've got to do more on the issues of race and poverty to be against what the left is doing. We got to talk about what we stand for. Uh, and what she stood for was the, our work with mediating institutions, that the people who are suffering the problem have um, some very insight and, and, will, and, and wisdom as to what those solutions are. And so Mitch stood, uh, with us uh, firmly in harnessing uh, that. Usually when conservatives uh, are talking about poverty, the first thing scholars do is reach and do a, a literature search. But Midge join us in asking the people suffering the problem what the solutions are and generating solutions and supporting those elements within that community to, to help themselves. Um, uh, I, I remember her so well walking with us uh, in, in talking about supporting mediating structures. Unfortunately, for about five years, 
the conservative movement did embrace it uh, from the American Enterprise Institute, but soon they abandoned, abandoned it. And I remember, Ed, in, um, in 1983, Ewell started the Mandate for Leadership series critiquing the, the Reagan policies. And um, God bless you for tolerating a dissenting essay in 83 when I wrote it with Midge's uh, guidance when I said that it is not enough for the conservatives to be against uh, what the left is doing and that just cutting budgets, Reagan was lauded for cutting the, the poverty budgets. And I said, you, you qualify as a low budget liberal if you don't promote reforms. Um, and I took a lot of heat for that, but not for Midge. She called me up and encouraged me and said, we must go further and challenge our colleagues to offer positive alternatives on issues of poverty and race, and that the conservative movement needs to go beyond just being colorblind, that it must work to enable those uh, in the communities uh, who are in poverty but not of poverty, and because they are the heroes that have the solutions. And uh, Midge stood with us in gathering the resources to confront the enemy within but of all of the, of the things I remember her for, it is that she was a, not a guilty white woman. I, I am being, I'm a self-certified racial exorcist. <laughs> I uh, exempt all white people from the guilt of slavery and Jim Crow. $50, I'll give you a certificate, so. <laughs> When you get accused of being a racist, you can say, oh, no, Bob exempted me. Okay. Bob, you mentioned, I, I, um, you mentioned that word mediating institutions. And it's funny because I, I, conservatives, we're very good at talking about the state and we're very good at talking about the individual. And then we have these vague words for talking about these other things that we think are the most important, meeting in, mediating institutions and civil society, right? It's kind of sort of the other stuff. Um, and yet, I mean, it takes you 45 minutes of reading Midge and listening to you to realize, well, actually, that other stuff is the, it's the important stuff. Why do we, what do we, what is this mediating institution? What does this even mean? What's, what, what are we mediating between? What's the, I mean, because there's obviously a whole short argument in the term. Well, First of all, when but took less, the black community is often used as a moral barometer of the health of the country. And so what the left is saying today, the problems that you're witnessing of out of wedlock birth, of violence and whatnot, all the upheaval, that, that's a legacy of slavery in this country. It's just not true. So we published a series of essays uh, when whites were at their worst, blacks were at their best. When government was hostile to everything we stood for, we had to rely upon institutions within our community. There was a survey done by one of our scholars that looked at the birth records of six major plantations after slavery. 75% had a man and a woman raising children. And for 100 years, the nuclear family prevailed in, in society. In 1932 to 1940, 1930 to 40, the black community had the highest marriage rate of any group in society. And elderly people could walk safely without being uh, mugged by their grandchildren. And there were no guns fired in those communities. And so, there, so it, these institutions that uh, raised the literacy rates, only 10% of black ex-slaves were literate, but the Sabbath schools, the church schools on Saturday raised it to within 40 years, 70% were literate. That hasn't happened anywhere, anywhere in the world. And so it is these, those are the kind of institutions that built uh, hotels when we were denied, medical schools, theaters, a whole array of things. But all of that changed in the last 60 years when government came in and undermined all those institutions that stood between individuals and, and their community. So that, that's the range of, of th that's the devastating effect that government had th that I say, welcome back Bull Connors. Then, and when, when you're dealing with this, uh, the, the enemy with, uh, within, right now the enemy is, is, is coming within and not external. But these institutions are the ones that serve the, 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 the black community well. And so you're talking about the institutions in this 
in this case of the family and the church. Family, primarily. church. Yeah, and their, and their sort of interconnection. Um, and Abby, um, you've noted that, uh, that Midge recognized the danger early on of uh, the kind of commitment to destruction and revolution on the left, which was perforce uh, intended, of course, in part to attack these mediating institutions and destroy them because they were impediments. And so I'm just wondering, I mean, if we're, we're reading her, her commentaries on these things 40, 45 years ago, and they seem so pertinent to the moment, should we be encouraged that this battle's been going on for 40 years um, or discouraged? <laughs> right. Well, um, I, I want to take up much of what you were saying, Bob, because um, I think that um, exactly what you were describing uh, for the black community is what we need across the country for families. And that's because um, it's going to require a very broad-based shift, right? Um, we've had such a long-standing attack um, on the idea of families, and um, Midge was excellent at critiquing the even idea of wanting to talk about families. This is another thing that was really wonderful about her. She could ridicule the notion of even discussing family because she would, as she would say, snot-nosed children, why would I want to talk about that? <laughs> or arguing uncles and uh, fights at the dinner table, who wants to talk about that? But the truth is that um, what was going on uh, from outside was the notion that um, the family at all should exist. And in fact, we have a major political movement uh, committed to the idea that the Western defined nuclear family has to be destroyed. Um, and uh, she was absolutely um, right about needing to see taking on responsibility for children and raising children as the thing that will keep you on the right path, yeah. right? Um, that are a level of, um, she wrote, and I'm just going to read this because I thought it was fantastic, um, that the danger of each change or revolution carries the subliminal message that Americans are unlimited and infinitely malleable. The result has been that we no longer assume the onerous burden of trying to teach our children what life truly requires of people. People, even the freest people on earth, cannot make their own rules and cannot make up their own lives. We need to live in communities, communities of families, and we need to be affirmed and supported by others. And one of the biggest um, responsibilities we have is transmission. And this is another gift of Midge's, which is, and it comes, I think, from the Jewish tradition and also the American tradition, and we have to reclaim it. And that is, we have to transmit within our families, within our communities, um, what are the things that we affirm? Why it is necessary and important to have children? why it is necessary and important to raise them up as citizens. These are all um, aspects of this battle that we have to join. Jay, let me just uh, add a footnote to that, that I think that the, the, the pushback against in this culture war mm -hmm. will not be achieved by electing people to office. You can go to any low-income neighborhood, black, white, brown, dozen, and white, you cannot tell me which political party is in power or which political ideology. It's going to be fought in the culture. And, uh, and it's going to be won by low-income black patriots in these communities. They are the ones who are suffering the consequences of these distorted policies and attack on the culture. It was the, it was the uh, family faith and belief in this nation that enable the black community to survive. And if you go in these low-income communities, they are not confused about their pronouns. <laughs> they are not confused about that, Delano, right? 
they're not confused. And they are the ones that I think have the moral authority and the moral standing to push back against this assault on this nation's values. They are the ones, because if the left pretends to be the only legitimate representative of the, quote, marginalized, and they conflate the, the, the black experience with those of trans and others. Only black Americans wore the crown of thorns of slavery and discrimination. No one else has deserved the right to wear that or make that claim. And therefore, it is my belief that once they stand up and it's going to be a moral brush fire, that they are going to demand uh, a defense of these values. But, but we've got to, and that's what we're doing at the Woodson Center, is working to give voice to those who are suffering the most from the consequence of, of Mitch, Mitch called liberal bigotry. Well, so uh, this is my question then. What do conservatives, what do people in general need to do to make that happen? I mean, I'm just thinking it was not very long ago. What was it, three summers ago, the, the summer of George Floyd and Black Lives Matter, in which the Black Lives Matter website, right, took something that would have been perceived as completely unthinkable and put it right on their website that we're committed to the destruction of the nuclear family. Um, now this, I, I suspect the average uh, African-American would have thought this is crazy, uh, and yet at least the media portrayal was that this was completely mainstream. So what exactly has to happen so that this disconnect actually has uh, social consequence between the people that are supposed, you know, the marginalized that right. uh, the woke left is supposed to be uh, speaking for? I get a chance to quote my young friend here that I think this whole narrative is driven by a very narrow group of people, as Delano said, uh, white, guilty white people seeking absolution from crimes they didn't commit. Did I get that right? and also uh, uh, self-entitled elite blacks are seeking absolution from injustice they never suffered. Mm. They are driving it. The very fact, for instance, that they say that they're against defund they're for defunding the police. 80% of blacks polled are against defunding the police. Polls indicate that 60% that, that, that of blacks do not believe that racial discrimination is the biggest barrier, uh, 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 stumbling block to their flourishing. So the numbers are there. The problem is uh, too many institutions, and unfortunately some conservatives want, feel as if they've got to find absolution by, by, by partnering with and acknowledging them. Mm. Uh, uh, who was it? New Al Sharpton said, well, if uh, Rupert Murdoch is so hostile to me, why has he contributed to me? Mm. Why are some people like Bill O'Reilly and, and Sean Hannity early on visited Al Sharpton? Walter Williams said, and I have to say this, that too many conservatives and too many uh, um, tend to um, sacrifice old friends to appease old enemies. Hmm. And that has to stop. That the Pharaoh Joseph relationship is what's going to save America. We have to get wealthy conservatives partnering with low-income Josephs who are indigenous to these communities, who understand the importance of family, understand the importance of faith, and understand the importance of love of neighbor. Mm. Those traditions are still alive and well, but the qualities that make these grassroots leaders effective makes them invisible, because they're not protesting they're too busy in there. You've got to be like a Geiger counter and go find them because they're not looking for you. <laughs> but once we can mobilize this group to speak for themselves, you'll see a return this country to, to the values of our founders. Wonderful. So, Abby, I'm, I want to turn to you briefly before we take some questions from the audience here in person. But, I mean, what do you think, um, based on your understanding of Midge's analysis of the attacks on the family, what what is the, the primary danger? What is the greatest source of damage, do you think, in her view? Um, well, I, I, I think that one of the things we have to, um, we have to focus on is uh, a very small thing that I think um, Midge understood and, um, and certainly spoke about, and we can um, just say it very plainly, which is um, that uh, having children and having a family 
is of primary importance, mm. right? This is, um, it's, it's wonderful um, to have a career and get an education, but um, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, I'll just give you a small example. The Wall Street Journal published an article earlier this week, why Americans are having fewer babies. And here was one uh, of the earlier um, questions. At the heart of the falling birth rate is a central question. Do American women simply want fewer children or are life circumstances impeding them from having the children that they desire? And my answer would be that has anyone ever asked polled women um, to say, is it important that you have a ch child, that you have children within a family, that you are raising them to be good Americans, good citizens, that you are concerned about the impact they have on the world. Midge called talking about great-grandchildren greedy, um, but she extolled the miracle of her own grandchildren. In 2001, she said, without knowing much more of their stories, how can I ever really know how my own comes out, right? So she's already thinking, she understands implicitly that the value of her own life is tied up with her descendants. And that's uh, of primary importance that we have to really convey um, to, uh, to, our, to our children as we're raising them and um, to our communities, within our communities, that that is really the impact you, you have is through your descendants. Perfect. Well, let's end with that and take some questions uh, in the audience. So we have someone with microphones. And for those of you that have been following the discussion on family policy, you'll know um, that there's a widespread concern across the political spectrum about demographic collapse in this country, though at the moment mostly on the right because we're not even at replacement rate in the United States or in most of the developed world. So it's a serious social problem. It's also a serious demographic problem. So happy to take questions for about the next 13 minutes. Yeah. Don't be shy. <laughs> My, my name is Yaya Fanusi. I was just just want to keep them moving. I think what conservative in America should do is to check the African immigrants in this country. Hmm. They are ninety nine percent what you would call conservatives. We are traditionalists. Everything you talk about, family, blah 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 blah, we are for it. Hmm. So how come most of them are with the the, the, the Democrats? So you have to figure out what they are doing that you're not doing. Mm -hmm. It's a great question. Bob, you want to take a stab at that? He say, when someone wants to compare my, me to whites, I said, no, I want to be compared to a Nigerian. Because <laughs> <laughs> they have a higher education level, they have a higher per capita and higher wealth level. So, no, so it, it puts the lie to the notion that racial discrimination is, is they're underrepresented in prison and overrepresented in wealth. <laughs> That's a good combination. Uh, yes, do we have a provision for online questions as well? Okay, so we'll keep doing them in the, in the room for now, though. Yes, over here. Uh, could you comment on the election in Chicago? <laughs> I don't have words to discuss it. I mean, it shows you how, how bad and corrupt the electoral process is, that, that you can have a light foot light come in. It was worse than the person. It, it, it's really a self-destructive cycle. I just think that when you look at the polls in the black community, the two issues that keep coming up is police and race. And, and that, that, that means that that population has totally been corrupted by Democrats have, have uh, chosen to sacrifice black bodies for black votes. 
And as long as we can keep the black community angry, disturbed, frustrated, um, they will remain manipulative. You can do nothing angry that's of use to you. You can't make love, you can't eat, you can't sleep. All you can do is vote. <laughs> okay, something less depressing. <laughs> and so I saw a hand over here somewhere. Dr. Myrtle Alexander, Institute for Academic Management. You mentioned Black Lives Matter and the fact that their motto is to destroy that of the nuclear family. The companies that supported Black Lives Matter over the last three years to the tune of, I think, some $97 billion, you mentioned that it's out of guilt. How do we turn those companies' minds now and their, their, their donations to the better good of America? Education. One of the things that I know you want to join. One of the things that we're doing at the Woodson Center is a, there's a difference between people who are ill-informed and ill-intentioned. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of companies think that they can find absolution by partnering with organizations, uh, civil rights organizations. They don't understand that the black community is not politically or ideologically monolithic. And I think what we're trying to do is go to those companies and say to them, demonstrate to them that they can support initiatives within the, the black community uh, and, and establish partnerships with people who are value aligned. See, one thing I, and I, I find some surprising groups of whites who are finding common ground with the civil rights community and I asked, if they were white, would you be in, uh, in partnership with them? And if the answer is no, then you shouldn't be in partner with them. Mm -hmm. And so that, but I think it's important, uh, not a, uh, it's important not just to condemn those companies, but offer them an alternative. If, uh, if, if, if the left knew that those companies were helping low-income people to start small businesses, to reduce crime, and repair families, um, it would insulate them from any criticism from the left because they're doing legitimate work. But they, they, people don't know that. Uh, I just want to turn to the question of education. Um, and, and even in the case of Black Lives Matter, I think that um, we are seeing a shift. Um, it's one of the silver linings, I would say, about the pandemic, which is that um, Parents have gotten a very good look um, at what is going on in schools. And um, there are some very, very messy, ugly fights, but very necessary ones that are going on. And in terms of the, um, the we've had the example of one size fits all problem solving. And that's just not what we need now. What we need is very, very um, multi a multiplicity of activists who are going to go to their local school board and their local school and even to their fellow parents to be able to say, you know, I'm not sure that this is what I want my first grader to be hearing about. I'm not sure this is what I want my kindergartner or my eighth grader or my 12th grader to be hearing about. Um, and uh, there, are, there are organizations that have been um, bubbling up. Um, whether uh, they turn the tide is a question of time and real energy. Yeah, because I mean, this is the distressing thing about the the uh, sort of cycle of despair in cities like Chicago, as it seems that there's not an obvious feedback mechanism politically for reform. But that is, I think, the silver lining of one of the silver linings of, of COVID is that many parents discovered what was happening in their public schools. And so we've certainly seen this in 2023, a much larger interest uh, demographically across the spectrum for things like school choice, uh, which I think is a is certainly a positive d development. So over here, we've got several hands. I don't know where the mics are. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I'm Juliana Pilan, and I cannot begin to tell you what a joy it is to be here. I knew Midge 
I started at Heritage in 1981 as well, um, stayed for eight years, and Midge was a force of nature. She would be delighted to be here. Um, I have a question I should have introduced. Uh, I'm with the Alexander Hamilton for the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, which brings me to the matter of education that is so critical. To follow up on your question and Abby's response and Bob, um, I would like to remind everybody here, I suspect everyone knows about the incredible upsurge of classical education and the great books. Having my degrees from the University of Chicago, <laughs> talk about a city that should know better. Um, I have a specific question about your opinion regarding the Civic Alliance controversy, Danielle Allen's approach and, and others. The Civic, uh, perhaps you could just uh, follow up on that. Juliana, you said the, the Civic Alliance? Yes. I'm not familiar with it. Okay. Maybe tell us. Well, no. then, well, then in, in that case, uh, well, the controversy is fairly new. But it has to do with, as you're saying, the debates regarding how to teach civic education. Mm. As the National Association of Scholars has done a number of recent studies, civic education is often a euphemism mm. for activism. And there's some of that in the Civic Alliance Network as well. Some of, uh, and so if you could comment on uh, more of the, the new approaches, on the one hand, the, the wonderful initiative to teach great books uh, in, the, uh, in the elementary school level even, but on the other hand, the, the subterfuge of using some, uh, uh, some of these legitimate concerns about teaching students the facts to, uh, to do something completely different. So I would love to answer this question. I'm going to make it hugely personal and just tell you about my kids' school. Um, so uh, I would just say the biggest issue I think we have about civics education is inertia, right? Uh, and that is to say there's a system in place usually um, of social studies education. It's, it's fairly benign, but it's not US history, right? And it's not civics education. There's usually seventh grade civics, which is kind of dry and boring and just refers to, you know, the branches of government, but not even in a schoolhouse rock kind of way. So it's not set to music. Um, so I, I would say that um, you, we could certainly look for um, ideological battles that are going on. But um, in my current experience, I would just say that mainly it's a lot of doing what's been done. And um, very small things can make a big difference. So uh, one thing that I did at my kids' school was uh, there's a naturalization ceremony once a month in Pittsburgh, where I live. And I told uh, their teachers that I was going to take my kids' classes to this naturalization ceremony. Um, you know, I'm a naturalized U.S. citizen. It's a miracle. And I want my children to understand that it's a miracle. Their passport is a miracle. So I uh, took my kids' class. Now, uh, you know, I'm not sure they really understood what they were doing there, but it's a small thing. Um, and I, I highly encourage, if you are parents, if you are grandparents, if you have a school in your neighborhood, tell the principal that you want to go to your local naturalization ceremony. It's very moving. And it really is a, a, a small way of being able to slowly inculcate the idea that we have to actively transmit the, the values that are important to us. 
right? You, you can't sit back, it does not, democracy does not happen by osmosis. You do not learn it just because you're standing next to an American flag. You actually have to actively participate and, and transmit information. Yeah, we have, uh, at the Woodson Center, uh, we published 1776 Unites, a series of essays to counter 1619 that defined America by uh, its, its birth defect of slavery. Um, and we felt that the messengers uh, attacking the nation were black, and so the messengers affirming the country should be black. So we brought together uh, mostly black uh, and scholars and activists and we published this book, and, it, and we developed curriculum from it, um, 14 lessons that are free, and we've had 96,000 downloads in the last year, uh, so that the demand for credible information is there. Uh, we have to, uh, I mean, but also when you have an institutions like one of the ones that we found called the Piney Wood School, ever you should see that, it's a 115-year-old boarding school uh, where they take only children that are from the most challenged families, and 96% of them go on to college. And um, they, it's, it's a rich tradition, and, and it's important for us to get, and they have mandatory chapel, uh, mandatory work, <laughs> and they have survived the whole period of wokeness. It's important for us to get behind institutions like this and, and provide the kind of support and write about that, and I hope scholars will, will do it. We're also working with Pepperdine to establish the Center for the Study of Resilience. We don't sp spend enough time studying how people succeed under difficult circumstances hmm. and what lessons can we learn from those who uh, achieve against the odds. So those are the kinds of things that we can get behind that are positive, that are life-affirming, that provide an alternative uh, to what the left is producing. Well, we're out of time. Please join me in thanking Abby Schechter and Bob Woodson. So we're gonna pivot directly to the next panel on security and national defense, and I would like to introduce Karen Skinner to the stage who will introduce her panel. hear me? Yes. Um, thank you all for being here. I hope we have quite a few young people, among others, um, streaming and watching us because this conversation is so relevant to today. I mean, this is much more relevant than many of the conversations that we have um, around issues facing our nation and the world. We're supposed to talk about another big part of Midge Dechter's life, her role as a national security expert and her contrib contributions um, to U.S. foreign policy. I think it's no surprise that Ed Fulner, the former president of Heritage, would have included um, Ms. Dechter on his board because, like Heritage, she covered all aspects of policy. I think her role in foreign policy is often overlooked. Um, it was much more interesting in the 70s to be someone who challenged feminism and, um, and joined with Phyllis Schlafly and others um, against the growing ERA movement and um, many of the um, so-called sexy activities of that period. And, but she, she was so comprehensive as a social critic that she was able to take on not only domestic politics, but um, trade and commerce and bombs and bullets. So we're going to try to do some of that in our discussion today. And we have an amazing panel. I don't think I could have a better panel than the one I have here to talk about her background. Um, Tevi Troy and I know each other through Zoom. Um, he's an accomplished <laughs> author. I've held a book event for him at the height of COVID, um, and we became fast friends. He's at the Bipartisan Center as a fellow. 
And then Victoria Coates and I have a long history. She too um, is an accomplished author. And we served in the Trump transition team, team in 2016 and in the administration, and we're still alive. Um, so um, this is- this Even is, thriving. Uh, this is a good day. So the way I thought I would start um, with my comments is to not really make comments at all, but to read something that um, Mitch Dector wrote in the early 80s about basically grand strategy. And I think you'll find it fascinating and kind of plug in the words that relate to today. So here I go. Give me one second. I've gotten a little older, so I don't always see as well. Um, but her words were, I thought, very, very inspiring. This is an article she wrote for Imprim Imprimis, I guess that's what it was called, in 1982, April. And it's quite comprehensive, but I just cherry-picked, I think, some of her best thoughts. I wish to begin with a proposition that we, that we know what most of the American people want the role of the United States in world affairs to be. We know, it, uh, we know it because we have said so, and the evidence that they have said so is, uh, um, is the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. The year 1980 is important. It was simply inconceivable five or 10 years ago that Ronald Reagan could become president, just as it was inconceivable in 1980 that anyone but Ronald Reagan would become president. As what has become known as a neoconservative, I have surrendered um, to um, the title, though neither I nor anyone else knows exactly what it means. Tevi will tell us what it means. Um, I was far more certain of this outcome than many of my friends who had been wandering with Reagan faithfully for years in the minority wilderness. I was more certain not because of any superior wisdom, but because I had the great advantage of taking the um, this country's shift to Reagan on my own pulse. And one, one's own po pulse, um, one's own true pulse, is the place to read the American, the country's temper. Then she goes on, many paragraphs later, the point is that the election of 1980 was the coming to fruition of a feeling that had been growing in the country um, bit by bit over the 1970s and could no longer be held off by the rhetorical tricks of those in power. I have defined this feeling in the simplest terms because it is a simple feeling. Make us great again. Now, the word great for many Americans does not only mean powerful and rich, though certainly that is, certainly that. It also means, and has always meant, in Reagan's own words, make us the city on the hill. She goes on. I thought that was interesting. She talks about make America great again. Um, the fact of the matter is that in in a world more and more um, of whose real estate is coming to stand in the shadow of the Soviet empire, in such a world, the world we inhabit today, the United States has only two choices of policy. A, we have the option to do everything in our power to undermine the economic, political, and military strength of our enemy, B, we have the, the option of accommodating ourselves to the ever-increasing spread of the enemy's power. So far, we must face the fact that when, whether Reagan knows it or not, and he's president now, option B cont um, has continued to be the policy of his administration, not the language of his administration, and not the language, uh, and language is important, not the desire of his administration, and desire is vitally important, but nevertheless, alas, the policy of his administration. That is why my question about World War III cannot be yet answered with assurance. Midge Dector, 1982. 
I want to start with the conversation, start the conversation by asking my co-panelists to react to what I just read. Tevi? Well, I'll go first. And I really enjoyed hearing those excerpts. She was such a great writer, Midge Decker was. I read so many of her articles in, in my youth. I hadn't read this one. So it was, uh, it was good to get that uh, reminder of how powerful her words were, how trenchant her thoughts were, how culturally knowledgeable she was. I mean, she understood culture before she understood politics. She never wanted to be a political activist. She wanted to be a writer about culture, and she was so skillful at it. I also think it's very interesting how critical she was of the Reagan foreign policy in the early 80s. You know, her husband, Norman Pithartz, also wrote a famous article in the New York Times Magazine calling the Reagan administration's foreign policy a failure. Uh, he amended that later when the Reagan administration, I guess, got stronger on the policy in addition to the desire and in addition to the rhetoric, as Midge pointed out. So I think that, uh, Kyron, I'm not surprised that you skillfully picked out appropriate words that really captured so much of her and so much of what she was about. Thank you. Um, Victoria? Well, thank you, Kyron and, and Ted, for putting all of this together. And, and I'm something of an interloper. I did not know, I cannot claim to have known Midge well at all, just to say hello to, but we did share one overriding interest, which is in Donald Rumsfeld, of all things. And uh, I often thought we might be actually great co-panelists on Jeopardy because we could compete in our encyclopedic knowledge of, of DR. Uh, <laughs> and of course, he is also central to the DNA, like she was to Heritage. The first time I met Dr. Fulner was staffing Rumsfeld when he came here in 2007 uh, for the awards dinner. And it was a very controversial time to be Rumsfeld staffer. And we were met by a sea of protesters and then Ed on the front stoop and they embraced like brothers. And it was, that was also my introduce, uh, introduction to heritage. Uh, and I think the quote you used there, Kyron, gets to both of their views on, on the strategy, Cold War strategy, which was accommodation or what, detente, uh, or we win, they lose. And I think for both Dector and Rumsfeld, you know, the choice was obviously the first one. Uh, the chapter in his book that deals with this is called Skunk at the Garden Party because he was never terribly fond of French words, detente among them. Uh, and so, you know, I think their feeling of, of kind of swimming against the tide during that period was, was a very powerful one. And obviously those words have just enormous resonance for us today as we are going to have to make our great national choice on China. Uh, and, and how do we want to approach this? And unfortunately, despite some good rhetoric, our current leadership appears to be in camp too. And you know, we, we as conservatives will have to decide if we want to embrace that le legacy of, of option one. Well, um, thank you for those comments. I was struck by all the reading that I did um, by her. And she, she, has, she wrote so much. Um, it, it, it would take you many months to find and read and absorb um, the full scope of her, her writing career and her speaking career as well, much of which happened um, at the Heritage Foundation, um, by the way. But I was struck by the fact that she was a bold critic of a president she had endorsed. Um, and, and even before he assumed office, she was a supporter of Ronald Reagan and was part of that group of um, the neoconservative um, Jewish intellectuals who abandoned Jimmy Carter well before his presidency. But here, just a couple of years later, um, she's really serving notice to a sitting president that he's, um, his administration, though rhetorically in line with his views, is abandoning um, um, those views in terms of actual policy. Um, I think a bold move. There weren't many women in the national security field at that time. I do not believe that she has, res um, um, she has been really honored for her work as a national security expert, um, especially during those years in the 1980s, where she was very active with, with the Committee for Free. Yes, and so you'll, t you'll talk about that in, um, in your remarks as well. Um, so I was struck by her national security acumen and her commitment to American values and, and her, the clarity with which she understood the Soviet challenge. 
um, decades later, she understood um, the global war on terrorism as a challenge as well. We'll talk about that um, also. But across her life, as she thought about foreign and defense policy, at the core of what I think she was attempting um, to support was um, the promotion of freedom and democracy around the world. Um, you may disagree in detail with how she arrived at that commitment, but that was an abiding commitment of hers. Um, let me just ask um, each of you a question or two based on your background um, with um, Midge Dector. Um, one, this will sound very basic, but I learned from Brian Lamb of C-SPAN, who in, um, interviewed me on in my first book, you ask a basic question of an author and you'll get a more detailed answer. Uh, here's one. How did a New York Jewish Democrat like Midge come to be a Republican? I'll take a first crack at that. And I think you really need to get into the idea of neoconservatism to understand this. So Midge, uh, she was actually, um, she did uh, live in New York, but she grew up in Minneapolis and she went to the University of Minnesota in addition to NYU and the Jewish Theological Seminary. She never got a degree from any of them, but she was, she was very well educated. She started writing uh, for commentary in the 1950s. She, first, she was a secretary there who was known as a very fast typist. Uh, she supposedly corrected um, Norman Pitharts about uh, pronunciation or, or a line from T.S. Eliot at one point showing her cultural knowledge. And I think it's really important to talk about her cultural expertise. If you read her writings, she writes about theater and she writes about novels back when a new novel coming out was an event, when, when these were things that, that people talked about. She was in that liberal milieu in New York in the 1960s. She had um, uh, she and Norman hosted a party for uh, Jackie O at their apartment in the mid-1960s after she was no longer first lady. Uh, Philip Roth, um, in, in this context, referred to Jackie O as that she which I think is great. Uh, <laughs> and, but she was really part of that world, that liberal New York Jewish intellectual world. And I think that's one of the reasons it was so shocking to people in that world when she did start to move to the right. And she moved to the right for the reasons that many of the other neoconservatives started to move. You, you said uh, a lot of them were Jewish. A lot of them weren't. They weren't all. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan, Jean Kirkpatrick, I mean, they, they, they weren't all Jewish. But they all shared this sensibility of Let's look and see if things are working. And if they're not working, how can we fix them? And this was very much the guiding spirit behind Irving Kristol's magazine, The Public Interest, which decided to take social science analysis to public policy problems. And if things weren't working, you had to call them out on it. So it's great that the Great Society is spending all this money to try and alleviate poverty, but what if it's not working? What if it's leading to dissolution of, of families? What if it's leading to additional dysfunction in, in the other inner city? These things needed to be analyzed, not just used as rhetoric, oh, we spent more money, so we're, we're better. And I think she was part of that group that was understanding that things weren't exactly working the way they were supposed to be in the Lyndon Johnson administration. And she wrote about the culture on the, uh, on the domestic side, but she also wrote about foreign policy. And she even said domestic policy is foreign policy and, and vice versa. They were, they were both integrally together. They were united. Uh, you needed to work on both sides of the equation to help remake America in, in the right way. And so she saw the flaws in the Democratic Party, and in the 1970s, she started something called the Coalition for a Democratic Majority. And this Coalition for a Democratic Majority was specifically aimed at the Democratic Party. It was trying to fix the Democratic Party and bring it back to its liberal Cold War roots. Um, and it was... Um, the Democratic Party was kind of drifting away and becoming less of a supporter of the Cold War, less of a supporter of Israel. She wanted to change those things. But she wasn't trying to go to the Republican Party by any means. She was trying to fix the Democrats. And there was a famous meeting that the Coalition for a Democratic Majority held in the White House, in the Carter White House, in the 1970s, late 1970s. And these people from the Coalition from a Democratic Majority, including uh, Ben Wattenberg, who was my mentor, uh, Midge, Elliot Abrams, Penn Kemble, uh, Gene Kirkpatrick, they went to the White House to hear from the Carter administration a defense of the Carter administration's 
foreign policy. And if you get a readout of this meeting, it's actually fascinating. Elliot Abrams said that Walter Mondale started off, he was the vice president under Carter, and liberal uh, union guy, but a cold warrior. He was a supporter of Israel. He was a supporter of the U.S. effort a against the Soviet Union. And by all accounts, he was great. He had them eating out of the palm of their hands. They were all on board with Walter Mondale. But then Jimmy Carter came in, and it went south fast. Carter was arrogant as he was. Uh, he was small-minded as he was, and he also – he just didn't give them what they needed to hear about a second term being better than that horrific first term. And when they left that meeting, Gene Kirkpatrick commented, I will never vote for that man. And that was the universal sentiment. So it was the drift of the Democratic Party in the 1970s that sent her off on this journey towards neoconservatism, which, again, is not what, how it's often interpreted today. But it was this group of smart, liberal intellectuals who were very well-rounded, who understood culture and politics and data, and they – used those lenses to examine what was happening, and they saw what was happening wasn't working, and they wanted to make things change. Um, thank you for that um, description of neoconservatism and her, her journey. Um, that meeting has been reported on quite a bit, and I think after they left the White House and they stood um, on the street corner, they walked into the arms of Ronald Reagan. Um, and so that was the beginning of, I think, the Reagan Democrats. Um, in, in earnest for the 1980 election. You're right to make the correction that the neoconservative movement was not just a Jewish movement or Jewish liberals turned conservative, but it was a conservative movement that was outside of really the party structure that included all kinds of Americans, Christians, and, and in fact, it was Senator Henry Jackson um, that really galvanized um, that community um, and they really had hoped he would be president. Um, let me um, now turn to, for one second, our friend um, Victoria and ask her about this unusual partnership, one that mystified me, um, Midge Dector and Don Rumsfeld. I was on Don Rumsfeld's defense policy board at the time, and I think it was at a dinner at his house that I met Midge Dector, and she was working on a biography. It never made sense um, that they would end up um, as partners, but I, I believe that he saw her as someone who had extreme clarity on post 9-11 challenges that the United States was facing abroad. And he ultimately agreed to have her um, write a memoir. How did all of that happen? Well, I think actually maybe we should have you write Jimmy Carter a thank you note for <laughs> delivering all that intellectual firepower to, to the Reagan camp. Uh, and I, I think I think you're absolutely right, Kyron, that that Rumsfeld saw Midge as a kind of intellectual guide, uh, and and the kind of clarity she brought the, to these issues really resonated with him. And the issue I wanted to talk about a little bit is one you raised, which was her support for freedom around the globe, and uh, reflections on on democracy, because it was thinking on her part that was informative to, to me as well when I wrote my book on the history of democracy, which hopefully uh, echoes a little bit of this. And she was on a panel here at Heritage in 1982 talking about uh, her, her views on the United Nations, which were somewhat dim. And uh, one of the things she said is that freedom, not democracy, is what the US should be setting out to offer people. And that the, the thing we first and foremost have to do is look after our own security if we want to offer that freedom. And it really was, I think, a continuation of what Gene Kirkpatrick had introduced in dictatorships and double standards, which is if I want to do something good for freedom around the globe, I start right here in the United States. And uh, you know, the last quote from that I wanted to mention was that if the United States is not strong and defended and full of thanks for its own political blessings, the truly freedom-loving men in other countries will not come to power, or if they do, they will not be so for long. And, you know, I think that was also informative uh, for, for Rumsfeld as, as he approached then the Iraq and Afghanistan and Iraq problem sets after 9-11, and clearly for both of them, 
9-11 was a very personal and searing experience, she being in New York and he being at the Pentagon. I actually asked him once if he took it personally and he said it would be hard not to. And I tried to fly a plane into my office. Uh, and so, you know, obviously it, it was a kind of inflection point and, you know, a couple of funny things they had in common, uh, you know, they were both just sticklers for precise language. And reading over some of Midge's things over the last couple of days preparing for this, her frequent comments, you know, this is sloppy language, this is dangerous language, when words would kind of get into a, a never, never land struck me because our, our current boss, uh, Kevin Roberts, is the same way. So we never ever use the word impactful anymore, sir, do we? Uh, <laughs> and then there was the question of they're both being very comfortable with Eastern elites but both being creatures of the Midwest and having Midwestern values. And looking through the Rumsfeld book, which is now 20 years old this year, you know, I think Midge's view was that Rumsfeld was able to bring these Midwestern values and perspectives, and obviously he was a deeply conservative person and politician as well as a uh, national security professional, uh, that he was able to bring these to bear after 9-11 in a way that was really compelling for the country. And that that was indeed true. Uh, and I certainly was part of the American public who saw those qualities in him before I knew him as an, as an individual. From his perspective, it was too heroic. Uh, he felt like it... it that that he he could never measure up to that to that vision because you know he was living in his own skin as an individual who was fallible, as we all are and and so I think I think for him, he 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 didn't feel he could live up to it uh, in in a funny way uh, it it of of the vision of of what he could be and you know it's interesting at the end of the book uh, which was completed before the Iraq invasion but everybody knew it was coming she read something to the effect that another war will come and then we'll see you know how he does and you know that that turned out to be to be quite prophetic but I think the biography as it stands is a real snapshot of that that time period between 9-11 and the Iraq invasion and the kind of effectiveness of his leadership and as such I think is a, a really wonderful tribute to him. Um, I'm also struck by the fact um, in addition to this kind of odd couple relationship that that really worked and I suggest her book on him to to everyone here that um, Mitch Dector was Tocquevillian in this particular way. She really believed in the power of civil society. Um, well before we had um, BLM, CRT, DEI, ESG, there was CDM, Committee for the Democratic Majority, um, CPD 2.0, Committee for the um, Present Danger, of which she was part of, um, the Committee for the Free World, of which she was executive director. I don't know how many more. Why did she spend so much of her time? Instead of being an editor, where she was probably well paid at basic, um, working in, well, not so well, um, and, but um, working in these various committees. And why did she think they mattered? And in your view, did they matter in terms of having an impact on public policy? Yeah, well, 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 of course they mattered. They mattered a great deal. But she never saw herself initially as a political activist. She saw herself as a cultural writer and a cultural critic. And her writing on culture was, was tr tremendous and wide-ranging, and she did it for a very long time across multiple publications. She wrote 69 pieces for commentary. As someone who's been privileged to write for commentary, every one is an honor, and to do it 69 times is, is really something astounding. And she saw, though, as I was talking about earlier with the, the neoconservatism, that there was something wrong, something needed to be fixed, and she thought she was one who could do the fixing. And she saw the CDM, despite what uh, what Victoria said about uh, bringing a whole bunch of intellectual talent to the Reagan administration, which it did, she saw it as a failure because she wanted to fix the Democratic Party, and she didn't succeed. The Democratic Party was was unfixable, and the CDM di didn't do it. She didn't necessarily see herself as a Republican at that time, and in fact, in 1976, she said that she still doesn't have any choice but to be a liberal. That's how she saw it as late as 1976. 
but as you said, with the, the rise of the Reagan administration, there was this sense that maybe the Republicans could be a welcoming home. And her son, John, worked in the Reagan administration, also in the Bush administration. Her son-in-law, Elliot Abrams, worked in the Reagan administration, had some very senior posts there. And she would be welcomed into the Reagan administration. She felt like it was a, a happy home, that she would have lunch at the White House mess with Ken Adelman and, and other figures in, in, the, in the White House uh, in the Reagan administration. So. Uh, you know, the Democratic Party was pushing her away. And in fact, the, the very fact that she was part of that milieu, but critical of it, led them to say the most horrible things about her. They called her, you know, from the left, they were calling her the dragon lady and all these terrible names. Uh, and the Republican Party was saying, come on in, the water's fine. And so she felt that welcome and she felt a concentration of interests and agreement with them on the need to fight the Soviet Union and to push back against the, uh, the, the, the rise of communism and, and to fight the Cold War. And so she created this Committee for a Free World, which was a hugely important organization. She made the case not just against the Soviet Union, but in favor of democratic capitalism. And it makes you wonder if perhaps we could use an organization like that again today. Nobody's making the case for democratic capitalism within the conservative movement, within the uh, Republican Party. And I think that case needs to be made. But she saw this as an agent with which we could, should prosecute the Cold War. And she succeeded. The, obviously, we won the Cold War. The Soviet Union collapsed. It's, it's a great thing. It's a great triumph for the Reagan administration. But it's also a triumph for the Committee for the Free World. And she did something very smart. And, and Ruth Weiss, who's in the audience, pointed this out in her terrific autobiography, where she said that when this happened, she shut down the Committee for a Free World. The Soviet Union collapsed. It had served, the CFW had served its purpose, and she shut it down. You know, Ronald Reagan said that the, uh, the greatest, um, the, the closest you can get to immortality in Washington is a temporary government commission. Uh, she didn't see it that way. With the Committee for a Free World, she saw this accomplished its mission, and we have to move on. And the New York Times even wrote about this and, and called her, there's this amazing phrase, they call, she called Ms. Dector one of the uh, frostiest sentinels on the ramparts of the Cold War which they considered an insult. I consider a compliment. <laughs> uh, but, but she shut it down because she had accomplished her mission. And she, she did not succeed with the, the Coalition for a Democratic Majority in making the Democratic Party something that it frankly couldn't be again. But she succeeded with the Committee for a Free World in helping take down the Soviet Union. And that is something for which we should all be grateful. You know, she shut down certain organizations, but we're back in some of the same fights. Do you think she... Um, toward the end of her life was ready to start again? Um, or was she, had she really passed the torch? And if so, who did she pass the torch to? Was it metaphorically all of us, or did she have some in particular? I'll take a quick crack at that. Uh, I mean, look, she passed the torch so well. I mean, obviously, her son, John, is the editor of Commentary Magazine and doing an amazing job with it. Elliot Abrams had senior jobs not only in the Reagan administration, but also in the Bush administration and did work with the, the Trump administration. Um, you look at the people who wrote those wonderful uh, uh, obituaries of her, Yuval Levin and uh, Jody Bottom, uh, who worked with her in an office at the Weekly Standard and talked about what an influence she was on him. So she has all these intellectual she has these actual children, including uh, Naomi sitting right here, uh, but these intellectual children as well. And I think you know, the, the, the CFW was a great accomplishment by her, but the task of fighting against wokeism and against authoritarian nations like Russia and China, the, the task of that is on to a new generation. And I think she situated that new generation well with her writing, her thinking, and her activism, the way you can create an organization that really matters, that makes a difference. So she's not with us un anymore, unfortunately, and that's why we're all gathered here to honor her memory. But I think she has given us the tools with which to fight back and to help uh, change the trajectory you're on if we're willing to use those tools. And just one quick Follow up uh, to Tevi, which is I think you know what we're literally doing here today is is a testimony to what those organizations did, as I understand them, which are bringing you know big brains together to grapple with big problems mm -hmm. and try to get to solutions. It certainly wasn't a collective exercise in navel gazing. It was you know how what's what's your outcome? How are, how are you going to get this situation under control? Hopefully rectified and. You know, I think that continues to inform what we do every day uh, here at Heritage, but but very much, you know, an experience like this 
where you know I might not have thought about the family issues that were discussed in the first panel and look forward to learning more from Mike and his group in the next panel because uh, they're, they're not my issues but but they can inform me and in my and my approach and so I think that's very much part of what what she was doing um, I, I absolutely agree and the fact that we are bringing all parts of heritage together um, in various panels I think speaks to the breadth of her um, impact, her enduring legacy. Um, I'm told that I'm supposed to open this up for um, q and I just like to keep talking, but there is an audience here. <laughs> I'm a professor, giving me a microphone is a very dangerous um, thing. If someone could bring the microphone forward. And while you're doing that, I'd like to mention another protege who's here today of Midge Dector. Speaking of her legacy is Abby Schachter, um, a former colleague of mine at um, Carnegie Mellon University. Your discussion of her role in thinking about the family is really critical, and I know how central that is to the, the work that you do as well, so thank you. And we should also mention Ruthie Bloom, her daughter, who's a columnist at the uh, Jerusalem Post and writes great stuff defending Israel. Yeah, I think we could keep going on this, but but um, we're in. Um, but we're. I think there are many people. Almost everyone here. Um, yes. The, Please uh, stand um, up and give I, us your uh, name. Pat Span, um, just retired uh, government guy, and uh, I was wondering if the um, the fact that the Democratic Party wouldn't support um, Ford's uh, push to. Um, provide uh, aid to Vietnam during the conventional invasion. A lot of people don't realize it wasn't the insurgency. I had a, actually had an infantry platoon in Vietnam, so it, it wasn't an insurgency. It was a conventional invasion that caused the downfall of South Vietnam. I wondered if that had an effect on her, that the fact that the uh, Democratic Party uh, wouldn't support Ford's push to give some uh, aid, to continue to give aid to South Vietnam to keep them from falling. I, I think that was uh, certainly an important moment, and I think a lot of people in the neoconservative movement noticed what happened there, that the, the Democrats really uh, let a lot of uh, blood and treasure that we expended on trying to uh, maintain a uh, non-communist nation in uh, South Vietnam, they let, they let it go to waste uh, because of they basically peak with Richard Nixon. I thought it was, a, it was not a serious decision that they made there, and uh, I think the, the neoconservatives noticed. I, I agree, and I, I know it was it was searing for Rumsfeld. He was serving as Ford's chief of staff uh, in April uh, of seventy four five. <laughs> so talk about age uh, with the fall of Saigon. Uh, you know, so he's literally in the Oval Office as as that was happening. And you know, one of the things that always stayed in the forefront of his mind because he he had been serving in Congress through sixty nine, so he knew a lot of those people and the imperative to keep popular support beyond your ideological base for a war effort is critically important. We're seeing this play out again mm -hmm. today. Uh, and you know that that if you are going to commit the United States to an exercise like that, that you have to have the American people behind you for to whatever extent, or else they're going to act through the Congress. And you, as I said, you can see it happening again. It's a really important lesson. Yeah. Um, she does um, write and talk about Vietnam in the, the long piece that I cite as part of the failure of detente um, and the reason that the pulse of the American public changed um, from that the quote that I read. Um, are there other questions, hands, statements? Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Bill Walters. Uh, my question is, since the rage these days is to laud Henry Kissinger's 100th birthday, what was the relationship between Henry Kissinger and Midge? My short answer is I don't know. I should ask Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> I think I should know, but I don't know that one. Tevi, do you have? Um... Well, I, I know that a lot of the neoconservatives were um, critical of detente, but he was also um, in that circle, and they were they were friendly with him. They knew him, but um, but there, there was certainly a disagreement about uh, foreign policy approaches. Yeah, I'm sure that that's not the hardest um, um, question to find the answer to, but I think it speaks, the fact that I don't know it um, speaks to the fact that um, if you look at the public record, she's there in these big discussions on foreign policy during the Nixon, Ford, and Reagan eras. But we, the scholars don't include um, her as much as they should mm -hmm. in terms of the role that she played outside of government and influencing. So 
I'll try to write something about that and, and you know, give me your email address and I'll make sure you receive it. Um, do we have other comments or questions or statements? Yes, sir, and then I'll come back um, to you. I guess the, uh, the point that was just raised, uh, and this also applies to uh, Ronald Reagan as well, is that Mitch stood against Reagan and as well as Henry Kissinger mm -hmm. on the president's trip to the cemetery in Germany of Bitburg. And if you remember, it was Helmut Kohl who wanted this, uh, I think the 40th anniversary of victory over Europe. Mm -hmm. And it was decided as a form of gesture that he would visit just a cemetery of regular German soldiers. Mm -hmm. But it turned out there were 40 or 50 SS uh, buried there as well. Mm -hmm. And so it became quite a controversy. And many said, you know, and Elie Wiesel, uh, Holocaust survivor, of course, Nobel Prize winner at that time, said, Mr. President, your side is on the victims, not the perpetrators. But Henry Kissinger and Richard Nixon said to President Reagan that he should go anyway. And Midge said, no, you know, here you are, you know, known for fighting totalitarianism, and yet you're going to a cemetery, and for all intents and purposes, recognizing the SS as victims. This just did not make any sense, and really would shadow his, you know, his really persona. Uh, and then ultimately, of course, as you know, President Reagan did go, but it was decided that he would visit a concentration camp as well, as kind of a compromise. But she would take Henry Kissinger on, and she would also take on, mm -hmm for all intents and purposes, you know what I mean, uh, um, the president. So um, you can read this, I think it's in commentary, that must have been in the summer of 85. So yeah, she took on Henry Kissinger and President Reagan. Powerful, um, powerful words by her. I think she feared no one, and she did not fear power. Um, yes, you had, you wanted to make a statement, and can you wait for the, uh, for the microphone, thank you. And introduce yourself, please. I'm um, Naomi Dector, I'm Midge's daughter, and I just happen to know the answer to the Kissinger question. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, both she and my dad opposed him on detente and a lot of other stuff, um, but they are friends. Mm -hmm. That's the answer to your question. Do we have others? Um, while we're getting the microphone, I wanted to make one point, and, uh, um, and I know that Q&A is the central, but, and there are others as well, um, that um, the neoconservative term, it gets started in the 1970s. Now it means something, I think, very different, and I really would like to emphasize that, especially for the younger um, folks in the room who will assume policy jobs one day, um, it started, as you talked about, as a rejection of what was happening in the Democratic Party on social, social policy and foreign policy. Now it is seen as a kind of enlargement project on foreign policy. I don't think that that's quite right. Um, and even when, with the quote I read, she was kind of rejecting the term even though she was acquiescing to the term. Can we get some clarity on where we are with neoconservatism? I don't think every person who supports the um, the neoconservative point point of view wants a war a day. Yeah, the uh, well, well the phrase is actually a pejorative. Initially, uh, it was coined by Michael Harrington, who was critical of these people who were pr previously on the left, who are now being critical of the left, and he called them neoconservatives. Irving Kristol, who was the godfather of neoconservatism, embraces the term. But again, as I said, in the 70s and and 80s, it was re referring to these people who came from the left who took a social science approach, an analytical approach to conservatism, and um, uh, William F. Buckley actually praised them for bringing that form of analysis to conservatism. And then uh, in the 90s and beyond, it, it starts getting uh, to be characterized uh, unfairly and inaccurately as uh, what Jonah Goldberg refers to as bagel-snarfing warmongers, meaning it's a, it's a way, it's sort of a, an anti-Semitic slight on uh, people who seem to want to start a war a day, which it really isn't. Um, that's good to know. I, I thought you were right on that point. I served at state with Elliot Abrams um, recently, and I don't ever remember him coming to my office with a war plan. So, or a bagel, <laughs> and, or a bagel. I would. I, I, well, that's too bad. Uh, I I would just add, you know, that for Rumsfeld, the term was absolutely baffling because uh, he had never been anything but a conservative, 
and uh, so I mean, he mentioned it a couple of times, and it just sparked in my mind. We were talking about the 2008 election, and I asked him if it was going to be hard for him to vote for Senator McCain, and he said, Victoria, Mrs. Rumsfeld did not place me on this earth to vote for Democrats. <laughs> Like okay then, <laughs> I guess we we have clarity on where you are. Uh, so yeah, I think that the term has morphed into something that's now just tossed around very sloppily in a way that Midge would strongly disapprove of, uh, to mean whatever the speaker wants it to mean. Thank you for that that intervention. I know we have a question. And yeah, d just uh, just two comments. One on I think it's time for the term neoconservative to be retired. You know, Irving Kristol. Uh, advocated, you know, a, a more sober, restrained American foreign policy after the end of the Cold War. His son is, uh, who is, you know, now uh, essentially a leftist, uh, really supports the use of American power to spread uh, not so much democracy, but, you know, perhaps a woke imperium. So these, uh, these, these terms have lost their, the neoconservative in particular has lost its utility. But about Kissinger, I think it's the case that Nixon and Kissinger were wiser and more sober after they left office than when they were conducting their policy of detente between 1969 and 1977. And it is true that uh, not only the Podoritzes, but also somebody like William Buckley became very good friends with Kissinger from the 1980s on. And I do remember a uh, a long and quite uh, excellent piece by Norman Pedaritz in commentary uh, lauding Kissinger's White House years and his other memoirs as a great work of political literature. So uh, there's a story there, and I think in the, you know, after 75, 76, I think uh, most prominent conservatives found themselves more in alliance with Kissinger and Nixon than in opposition to him on, on a whole range of foreign policy issues. Um, thank you for that comment. I do think we need to rethink some of the terminology around conservatism in general. Um, we are over time, but we cannot um, deny um, Lee Edwards the opportunity to speak. Well, thank you, Karen. Uh, just would like to attest that Midge was a and in a close advisor to us when we started the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, that she was an advisor, she was a mentor, and she was a supporter of what we tried to do at a time when people said, you must be crazy to talk about the victims of communism. That, that is something that will never happen here in Washington, D.C. I'm happy to say that it is here, and one of the inspirations for it was was Midge Dector. Well, um, as you can see, there's a lot more that we could discuss, um, and we are being asked to take a brief re, um, um, rest. I think we have about less than 15 minutes, um, so we will get started again. So, uh, can you hear me? I guess this is on. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm Mike Gonzalez. I'm a senior fellow here at the Heritage Foundation. Um, so I had the, the immense privilege of having worked with Mitch when she was a, a member of the board and to benefit from her wisdom. Um, this is the last panel of this wonderful day and appropriately looks towards the future. The question it asks, what is it to discuss the, the future of conservatism? I think Tevi teed it up very well when he said it is the task that now the, the, the task of fighting wokeism has been passed to the new generation uh, by Mitch in many ways. Um, and there are very many different conversations regarding the future of conservatism that are taking place. Trust me, here at Heritage, we're deeply immersed in these conversations. But I think the one I'll talk about today, the one I'll bring it up out of my panel is we may want to take it in, 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 in a different direction is, is the one I think especially because it's Mitch's day, is the, uh, discussing the, 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 the role of the culture, uh, and, and especially what the left, once it's trying, has done to the culture, in, in, in conservatives' newfound uh, interest in taking the culture back, in clawing back from the left the, uh, the cultural institutions that they have taken. 
Um, Mitch gave a talk to the Heritage Board in 1994 that actually etched out this future. She said that regret regretfully, culture no longer meant, quote, the way most people living in the United States think and feel and behave towards one another, unquote. No. Culture, she said, now meant, quote, the way a particular gang of very powerful and influential people have for a long time now been insisting that Americans should, in should think and feel and behave towards one another. They're not so numerous, these powerful people, but they have succeeded in making so much noise that the rest of us can barely hear ourselves trying to think our own sensible th thoughts. You know, as a writer, it, it makes me envious to the, for the way she talks about a gang. You know, it's, that's really, because that's what they are, and yet we rarely call them by, by the right name, but Mitch did. She was also, so she was incredibly prescient uh, 30 years ago about what a situation is today. And, and, and typically, uh, Midge did not shirk responsibility. We are all responsible for having lost the, the great heights, the, the, the pinnacles of cultural production to the left for allowing them to take so much cultural ground. So she, she acknowledged that and she said, quote, that we have no wish to be here does not make us entirely blameless for our predicament. For too long, many of us hoped or pretended that all those influential people, the press, the media, the universities, the bureaucrats, the intellectuals, were not really all that powerful, that they would somehow go away or, we, or, or that we could get rid of them by outvoting them. Too many of us sat by and watched as our children and their friends were being trained in their schools and universities in song and story to serve as cannon fodder. But Mitch was not a pessimist. As you all know, she realized that it, it was time to fight to take the culture back. So she said, mere survival, of course, is not enough. For if it has taken many centuries to create the institutions of a, de of a democratic repub republic like ours, it need surely not take as long to destroy them. We are a free people, she added towards the end of her talk to the Heritage Board in 1994. What heritage has to do requires every ounce of our energy. She called them to, to her listeners to join the fight to, to retake the culture. She said, this time, let's not muff the chance. Um, I believe that this is where we are today. This is the conservatism of the present and of the future. I want to add parenthetically that in that essay, she gave credit what credit is due to Ed Fulmer for appointing her to the board. And she said that when, she was, when Ed first appointed her, uh, the other members of the board were looking at her and saying, oh, what kind of conservative is this? And that <laughs> soon enough, she showed the wisdom that Ed has had, as we all know, has. Um, I have the pleasure with me today on stage to have two eminent professors. Uh, one I already know, Daniel Mahoney, with whom I've had to uh, share panels. He's a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute and professor emeritus at Assumption University. The other one is a new acquaintance, Samuel Goldman. Sam is an associate professor of political science at George Washington University. So Sam, I want to start with you. Uh, how do you see Mitch Dexter's thought, her pioneer work in the culture, impacting the conservatism of the present and of the future? Uh, where was she right? Where, uh, if any, in, in, what, if anything, did she fail to anticipate? Yeah, so um, I should say that unlike uh, many of the other panelists and members of the audience, uh, I never met Dector uh, in person. I know her only through um, her writings, and that means that I approach this task with a certain trepidation um, because I can judge only on the basis of what I know. On the other hand, um, I can say that my acquaintance with Dector through her writings goes back quite a long time uh, to the late 90s when I was first beginning to get into interested in the world of ideas and conservative politics. Um, and since then, um, she has always been um, an inspiration and sometimes a provocation to me. Um, and I found that those qualities continued when um, I reviewed uh, some of her essays in preparation for this panel. And three sort of qualities um, stuck out to me as possible answers or partial answers to Mike's question. Um, and the first thing that 
I recognized uh, in rereading some of this material and reading for the first time um, some of the rest is how right Dechter was um, to emphasize slippery slope arguments. And I mention that because that's, that's a very unfashionable thing to do. Um, and one of the stock responses to any kind of conservative cultural criticism has been that it involves some implausible slippery slope. We make some minimal seeming change that's broadly appealing. And then the next thing you know, you're, you're in the gulag. But that's absurd. And therefore, we don't have to take these, these criticisms very seriously. Um, reading Dechter's writings, especially some of the ones about um, uh, family and feminism and sex and gender relations, as we now say, um, that was discussed in the first panel, really brought home to me that slippery slopes are real um, and that it is possible to see a trajectory years and decades off. Um, and it's not she who looks foolish for warning about the implications um, of uh, the feminist movement um, and criticisms of uh, the, the family that were then fairly radical and marginal um, arguments, she saw what was coming uh, in a way that really was um, prescient, uh, a word several people have used, uh, used already. Um, and I admit that reading this uh, sort of put the steel in, in my spine, because I'm one of these people who worries about exaggeration, about alarmism, about not being drawn into Manichaean distinctions between good and evil. Uh, reading, reading Dechter reminded me that Sometimes you really can tell where, where things are going, um, and you should be willing to take to take the heat um, in in saying so. Um, the second quality uh, that stuck out to me that I, I think um, is both a source of inspiration and I, I think can be uh, a model for uh, people who are carrying on elements of, of her work is her insistence on rooting her arguments in what we now call lived experience. Although um, I know that as an editor, if she were to encounter the phrase lived experience in a manuscript, she would get her pen out and very angrily uh, uh, cross, cross it out. We can just say experience in English. This is not German and you don't have to add uh, the, the qualifier. Um, but uh, she does not depart from either the kind of theoretical abstraction or sweeping historical analysis that characterized then and continues to characterize today um, a lot of conservative social and political commentary. Now, once again, uh, I should say that I do think um, she sometimes exaggerates um, or generalizes inappropriately from her own experience. So in one essay, she claims that no child has ever woken up in the middle of the night and called for its father. And I can tell you that I was up uh, at 3 o'clock last night, and I can assure you that this is not, this is not true. I wish, I wish that were true. Nevertheless, um, she, she remained close to normal experience in a way that gave her arguments a real weight that more elaborate theoretical or philosophical claims sometimes don't, don't have, um, and also makes them accessible to people who are not so concerned about the kinds of things that I and other professors spend our lives uh, arguing about. The third quality, um, which I think is, is related to this rootedness in experience, um, is what seems to me her indifference to some of the minute sectarian distinctions among conservatives uh, that were very much part of the debate uh, decades ago and have resurfaced in certain forms today. And the discussion at the end of the last panel about what, what it really means to be a neoconservative is, is an example of that. Um, she didn't seem very, very interested. 
in that. And uh, I, I read uh, an anecdote um, following up Elf Ed Fulner's account of how she was invited to join the board of Heritage, and she reports attending her first meeting, and people were sort of looking at her suspiciously. You know, who, who was she? What what kind of conservative was she? Was she a neoconservative? Was she something else? And she says something like, uh, "I assured them that I was a whole conservative or or a full conservative," uh, which I thought was in effect way of, of pointing out um, the, the insufficiency and, for most practical purposes, the irrelevance um, of some of these distinctions. She seemed to um, appreciate, in a way that should be a lesson to us all, that any political movement is uh, a, a coalition. Um, and any political majority is an even greater coalition. And as was discussed on the last panel, she was active in the campaign for a democratic majority. A majority is a good thing to have, and that requires bringing more people in uh, rather than expelling them on the basis of uh, ideological uh, ideological purity tests. And I think that, too, um, is a valuable lesson um, for thinking about the future of conservatism. It's not to say that there can't be any standards or that you have to get along equally well with, with uh, everyone. Famously, uh, she argued with many people, including some of, some of her best friends. But it's, it's, it's worth remembering um, that someone who agrees with you 60 or 70 percent of the time is a friend, and someone who agrees with you 100 percent of the time is probably crazy. Um, so it, it, the, the lesson, the lesson is, is not, not to ask too much um, from good faith allies and, uh, and potential allies. As for something she got wrong or failed to perceive, um, and this goes to uh, Mike's introductory comments, I think that she, like other so-called neoconservatives, I've just said we shouldn't use that term, but I'm going back to it. So I'm being I'm being inconsistent, but that that too is human. Um, believed that there was a deeper contradiction um, between the cultural left and capitalism than there seems to be. And this was an argument developed uh, by Daniel Bell, most famously, in The Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism. So the idea was, you know, people have to work hard, they have to save their money, they have to pay their bills, but now you have these, these hippies and they want sex and drugs and to party. They can't have jobs, they can't pay their bills, the economy will collapse, it will be a disaster. That, that doesn't seem to have been true in quite the way that she and others anticipated. Um, and I think it's, it's not accidental that one of the debates that is particularly lively today is what to do about so-called woke capital, because it doesn't fit neatly into that set of distinctions between um, democratic capitalism and the left or the new class that seemed to apply much more neatly um, 30 or 40 or certainly 50 years ago. That is uh so interesting, Sam, and you mentioned so many things. Before we move to Dan, I want to ask you if you can flesh something out. You talked about how the, the her and, and, and Norm and Irving Crystal, they all understood the, the importance of the culture way before anyone else. And I wondered if in, in your readings, even more than Bill Buckley understood the what was be, be going to be happening in the future. I remember there's an essay by, by Pat Horowitz for AI, I think, by Norman Pat Horowitz, in which he says, yeah, you know, if all everybody's coming around now to understanding the cultural issues, the, the importance of the culture. And he says, we're all Gramscians now. You know, it, this is a great quote by him, I think. Um, it, was there anything particular to to who they were, to to their, 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 their thinking of the culture, their being in New York, perhaps, that that made them so ahead of their time. As I said, I think even ahead of Bill Buckley. And if you don't have an answer to that, it's fine. I'll, we'll go to Dan. I, I don't. I don't have a great explanation, but I think you're right in um, the characterization, and that that is part of her achievement and the achievement of some of her contemporaries and colleagues. You know, I've, I, it sometimes has struck me um, that if you open up. 
uh, the, the conscience of a conservative, you know, Goldwater's great campaign book, the, the statement of that era of American conservatism. It's not what you think it's going to be about. There's a lot of foreign policy stuff that you can appreciate the relevance of. It seems less important today. And then there are like pages and pages about agriculture subsidies <laughs> and other stuff that just seems absolutely insignificant. What we now call cultural issues or the culture war is not on uh is not on the agenda yeah. um and uh Dechter, uh, among others again i said we shouldn't say neoconservatives but now i'm saying it um were were very important in looking sort of beneath the hood of public policy yes in the narrow sense right. and identifying the sources in American life of more more technical uh, technical disputes. Let me now turn to the great uh, Dan Mahoney. Uh, Dan, uh, I know you think that one of the most fascinating things about her body of work is that it was based on ordinary experience. I think Samuel talked about lived experience already on human nature. Uh, how does that impact the conservatism that is now evolving, if at all? You know, one thing that <clears throat> recently, over the last month or so, I reread at Old Wives' Tale and as well as this I Am Always Right, which is a collect selected writings of Mitch Decker, mainly delivered or maybe exclusively delivered here at the Heritage Foundation. And um, I was struck by her lucid and golden common sense. Her prose is quite elegant, but not elegant because it's fancy or refined, but it's an elegance of clarity an elegance of lucidity, of thought, uh, and uh, it's quite, quite impressive. Um, I'm also struck, and I mean this as a compliment, by how untheoretical Midge Decker was. And what I mean by that is, unlike many, I'm, Sam and I are trained in political philosophy and uh, range uh, more broadly than that, of course, but there's not a lot of references to the great political philosophers or to Burke or Tocqueville or Oakeshott or Leo Strauss. That's not the kind of writer and thinker Midge Decker was. She was extremely well-read. She was cultivated. But what a, what a obviously, she would not be expected to know the fine details, the fine print of Christian theology. But one of the funny moments in her memoir is when she talks about always running to her friend, Jim Nectarly and asking her what certain phrases mean as she's editing these articles for First Things. And, uh, and they were the kinds of abstractions beloved by uh, academics and intellectuals. That wasn't her world. Um, her world really was the world of culture, but it was she was extremely sensitive early on to what Lionel Trilling, uh, another intellectual and a, something of a mentor for Mitch Decker and, and Norman Pedartz, uh, uh, called the adversary culture. And um, she saw, I think, very early on through her own experience and also living in a world where abstract ideas had an almost immediate effect on how people talked and lived, I think she saw how pernicious many of these abstractions were, especially when they took the form of, I'll, I'll, I'll couple the great phrase of Lionel Trilling of the adversary culture with, a, I think, an even more suggestive phrase by the British conservative philosopher uh, Roger Scruton, the culture of repudiation. Well, Midge Dechter was, I think, one of the first to locate and to describe and to warn about the effects of the culture of repudiation. And that meant not only a repudiation negation of our civic inheritance, of our national experience, but it meant a repudiation and negation of the received traditions and wisdom of one's people, the Jewish people, the American nation, Western civilization, and she wrote about all these matters, especially, as has been emphasized today, uh, issues dealing with feminism and the family with, uh, with such uh, lucidity and with such insight. You know, it's easy when you're reading her memoir to say, so some of this seems quaint, you know, 
We're not talking about the ethics of affirmative action today. We're talking about whether America is an ontologically evil country, you know, with the, uh, the thesis of structural racism. Or, uh, you know, uh, Midge at one point in a memoir says, we've lost the capacity to acknowledge that there are meaningful differences between men and women. Well, today, I think the mainstream view, the review that's the view that's required uh, to be a beyond pensant, is to deny that there are men and women. You know, 173 genders and counting. This is what Edmund Burke called metaphysical madness. It uh, it's not a, a credible account of human experience. It's not how human beings think. It's a it's a project, and it's a project that's been imposed. Uh, on the country as a whole, and while many people on the center right suffered from a, 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 a lazy, uh, 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 you know, indifference to the cultural challenge, you know, the view that this will go away, the kids will graduate from college, they'll go out in the real world, a kind of a paramarxism or economism, you know, that the cultural matter, matters were not that fundamental. I thought Mitch Decker saw precisely was it, what was at stake, was the very understanding of what the human person was. She saw, for example, when women are no longer willing to accept the limits of the human condition, when educated women take advantage of unprecedented freedom and opportunity to lament their unprecedented exploitation, the only result with that is the decline of the womanliness of women will make men think even less about their own responsibilities to the women in their lives, to their wives, to their children, to others. She had a real concrete sense of human affections, of obligation. And I think she saw the power of ideological abstractions to confuse human beings, to make us unhappy as a people, and happy in our individual lives. And so I would say if some of the specific issues and formulations seem a little dated or quaint, it's precisely because, as, uh, as Sam said a moment ago, uh, Mitch Dechter had a, a, a unique gift for seeing the logic of ideas, seeing where this was all heading. And... Um, um, and it is true, I think very few of us would have thought that uh, right-minded people would uh, have to endorse gender ideology to be received in uh, polite society. But I don't think this kind of thing would, uh, would surprise Mitch Dechter. I'm also quite struck by how deeply conservative she was. And again, I don't mean that in a narrow political sense. I... Um, I, uh, one essay in particular in Always Right caught my attention, a 1986 address at the Heritage Foundation called, Is Conservatism Optimistic or Pessimistic? And I would say, while Mitch Dechter doesn't exactly come out on the pessimistic side, she doesn't have the time of day for optimism because people whose thoughts and lives are rooted in ordinary experience and good sense are not optimists. They recognize limits. Nothing is more conducive to the genuine flow of vitality than a full-hearted acceptance of the limits of man's nature and capacities. That's the optimism, or you might say the good cheer that can flow from a certain realism about the human condition. Conservatism makes you cheerful because in ways not always understood by many conservatives, it tells you what is given to you to do and what it is not given you to do in the course of each passing day. Um, one more quote. I think you're beginning to get the point. To accept the knowledge that as a human being you're li you are limited as true conservatism requires is to understand that life is not a right, but a gift. I think of a wonderful remark by the French political philosopher Bertrand de Juvenel, who wrote uh, that the, the wise man knows he is a debtor. You know, in a thousand ways, we have reasons for gratitude. And fundamentally, we have reasons for gratitude because life 
is a gift, and everything we're handed is a gift. Our country, our religious traditions, our, our, uh, our civilizational and cultural inheritance. And I think Mitch Dector knew that to her very bones. And I'm going to end these comments with, I recently came a remark, um, reading a manuscript by uh, uh, a posthumous book by the French political philosopher uh, Raymond Aron, Raymond Aron, who, um, it's his last lecture he gave at the Collège de France. He died in 1983. And he said he had concluded, he said, I'm a liberal in the sense that I believe that everyone ought to be free within broad limits to find their path in life or their paths in life. But nobody is free to invent their own tablets of good and evil. And that's the mix of liberalism and conservatism that Bidge Dector represented. When we run around trying to be autonomous beings, finding our own path in life in the false sense of trying to invent our own standards of right and wrong, good and evil, we will end up miserable and rejecting those gifts, those multiple reasons for gratitude that are at the source of authentic conservatism. So I tell you, you got to read this speech. It is about the, the freedom, the vitality, the dignity that flows from gratitude and accepting the givenness of the human condition. Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, I, I wonder if you comment on, on something that uh, of interest to me, at least, which is, is we talked about her populism before, the fact that they were populists. But they, you know, the people who live in the Isle of Manhattan are not known for being populistic. You know, what, do you have any insights as to what made her a populist? What, uh, for example, I think her, her rejection of abstraction is what allows her to write wonderful lines like a particular gang of influential and powerful people. I would never write such a line. It's a, you know, b b b which makes me envious. I mean, that was, it's a great, it's, it's putting it exactly as it is. you have any insights? On what well, I would just say if you have something like Midge Dector's insight about the danger of theoretical abstraction, the, the wisdom of tradition, experience, common sense. In principle, you're going to trust the judgment of ordinary people more than the judgment of experts and intellectuals. And, uh, you know, there's a, the political philosopher Leo Strauss once said, what are the practical tasks of political philosophy? Maybe not too many, but one of them is to defend sound theory a, a sound practice against bad theory. Mitch Dector was not a political philosopher, but she was really good at that. She had a certain confidence in ordinary experience of sound practice if it wasn't distorted by the intellectuals. Think of the 72 election. Most Americans hadn't gone to college. Uh, uh, you know, McGovern carried Massachusetts, and Massachusetts alone, my home state. I'm one of seven... Uh, Republicans in my town, you know, um, and uh, uh, but uh, you could you could meaningfully talk about a new class, as many neoconservative intellectuals did at the time. And Christopher Lash talked about this, the po you know the populist good sense of the lower middle class versus the irresponsibility of the intellectuals. Irving Kristol talked about this in a you know, I think a very illuminating way. But you know, the problem is that the ordinary good sense of the people has been. Uh, distorted by uh, bad theory. Too many people getting degrees in communications and sociology and social work and on social media and uh, all, all the, you know, ideological nonsense being pop, uh, popularized. And now we've got 11-year-old girls who think they're boys, you know. Uh, so um, I think there was always a limit to populism, and the limit is the following. What Midge Dector talked about so brilliantly in that 1986 address to the Heritage Foundation, that, that understanding of the givenness of things, of the lucidity of good, good, good gold and common sense, that needs to be defended. It needs an articulation. And, uh, and I think that's what, um, you know, the sort of people around commentary in the 70s discovered, you know, they were going to defend what was valuable in America against the adversarial culture. But what do you do when 
uh, the good sense of the people is fundamentally informed and distorted by ideology. I think that's where you are, are now. And it doesn't mean that a reliance on experience and good sense is a false path, but it does mean that the task is more complicated than it was when, you know, hard-edged ideology first started, uh, uh, you know, repudiating on our heritage. So we've got a we've got a more complicated project uh, ahead of us, but I think one that can be very much inspired and informed by Mitch Dector's wisdom. Yeah, at the end of um, the essay that you began by quoting, um, she concludes with, I think, a characteristic remark about the limits of politics and says something like, you know, we can't we can't expect to um, fix this with elections and laws, which doesn't mean ignoring elections and laws, but there's there's limits to what they can do. What what we can do and must do, she says, is is something like um, I'm going to make this sound more theoretical than she did. She she said it better. Um, is is to embody in our own lives the principles and the wisdom that we know to be correct. So I don't know if I'm allowed to quote uh, Barack Obama on this stage. No. Um, so someone may come with the At hook, <laughs> with, with the hook, like in the Apollo Theater. Um, Not my fault. But you you you. <laughs> Many of you remember, I, I suspect, the, the slogan, um, be the change. There's, a, there's actually, there, there's, there, there's, something, there's something to that. And I think part of the, the answer to the dilemma that Dan describes is that we have to show that it really is better. We really live better lives. It's but, not just a matter of argument. By the way, I just wrote a piece for the Claremont Review of books on Eric Vogelin, trying to translate him into the vernacular. That's sort of the opposite. But <laughs> Vogelin had a great one-sentence remark. No one is obliged to be complicit in the ideological deformation of the age. In other words, we don't have to succumb to the zeitgeist. We don't have to repeat lies. We don't have to give in to pressure. It's going to involve some intellectual and spiritual and civic courage, but um, there is still the option of saying no to this revolutionary transformation of ordinary experience. And um, that's certainly something worth, uh, that's, a, that's an insight I think very much worth pondering. You, you, this was great, you guys. And, and I, what I would say, Dan, is that it is hard, though. It is, it is hard to say no. Uh, it is it is easier to discuss the the top marginal tax rate and, and and to argue for lowering it than to talk about taking back the culture. I'm just saying. I, I but I before we go to questions, the name Elliot Abrams, a great member of the family, has been mentioned a bunch of times. He could not make it today. He emailed me yesterday. He's watching remotely. I want to say, Elliot, we're missing you here. And in 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 a panel on the future of conservatism. I cannot uh, not mention the fact that Matthew Continetti, a member of the Crystal family, is here. He is a great writer. He, he's a, I, I think the future of conservatism is safe in the hands of people like Matthew Continetti uh, by his book. Now, let's go to questions and answers. Um, the, the interns are going to come around. The interns have been instructed not to let go of the microphone. I saw in previous panels that people tried to wrest the microphone from their hands. <laughs> so so if, they're just doing their jobs. So, so, uh, so this gentleman right here. <laughs> Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, my name is Herman Bauma. Um, it seems to me that a big reason that our culture is going downhill and going downhill very quickly is because we as a nation no longer uh, have the understanding that the existence of the Creator is a self evident truth. And so now in our schools, we're indoctrinating our kids into the view that they're the result of random chance processes instead of. Being, having been designed by the Creator. And I was interested in when uh, Dr. Fulner was getting his introduction about Mitch Dector, I believe if I understood correctly, I think he said that she believes strongly in the importance of belief in God, I guess in, that the nation maintained belief in God. I was wondering, I'd like to get more information about uh, well, how did she think that should be promoted? Uh, just if, if you could elaborate on uh, this this fact that she strongly believes the importance of 
that belief in God is very important for the nation as a whole. Thank you for that question. I'll let my panels handle it. But at a lunch we had today here at Heritage, we discussed this, the abandonment of eternal truth and replace it with conceptual superstructures is really at the core of this, I think. But if you guys have any answers to brief before we go to that. Well, I'll begin by quoting George Washington in his farewell address, who said that uh, there are people, some people of minds of peculiar structure who may be able to do without belief in God and be decent people, but a free people needs to be a God-fearing people, needs to acknowledge uh, the supreme being and our debts to him. And uh, I think most p people of good sense have always acknowledged it. Of course, there are, you can always point to Uncle Harry, you know, the village atheist is such a lovely man and all that. But, you know, Lord Bryce, uh, in his great book, The American Commonwealth in 1888, said, um, everyone today, writing in 1888, who is a decent non-believer is formed by an atmosphere still largely shaped by an understanding right. of a moral law, right. of a purposive universe, etc. And he says, so his thought experiment in 1888 was, imagine a world where such confidence, where a kind of comprehensive nihilism, we live in a aimless, purposeless world, the, the choice between right and wrong is simply arbitrary, Etc. And he says that that probably be a very ugly world, you know. And uh, I don't know what Lord Bryce's personal religious convictions were, but I think uh, uh, I don't think Midge Dector was a proselytizer. Um, I, I suspect she had a complicated relationship to Judaism, but I think she she believed in the old verities. She believed in the God of her fathers. She believed in the Ten Commandments. She believed in decency, to use a word uh, George Orwell loved. And uh, I think I think she probably would have had doubts about, you know, proselytizing that at the national level. But I think she certainly would have said that uh, uh, having our public institutions, you know, turn to assaulting those old bedrock convictions of the American people would be a, a, a very dangerous and, and untruthful thing. So... Um, I think there is a middle position between, um, you know, uh, using governmental power to crusade for a moral restoration and being indifferent to, you know, the triumph of uh, intellectual and moral nihilism. Thank you. Let's try to get more and more questions. Uh, Madam, right there. <clears throat> Just, um, you've made me think this, um, there's so much about, the style that you've been talking about, the straightforwardness, everybody has mentioned these things. Without wanting to be the least facetious, I think that she was a thinker who had the great advantage of never having to write a PhD. Um, I mean that quite seriously. She never had to subordinate her thinking to anyone, to the indignity of having to really, you know, be an adult and still work at that level with the theories, with the language, and with all those obeisance that you have to do. And uh, we see the great advantage of it in her thought. You know, Ruth, one uh, problem I've had, like when I mentored ISI honor students, the ones who love literature, and they asked me where they should go to study. And I can't really recommend a serious graduate institution because I, I that naive love of the questions of truth, of the reason why liter you know, the human heart and mind responds to literature, it's been so corroded by, um, by theory in the most perverse sense of the term. But I agree with you completely, a PhD. Leo Strauss once said the first two uh, political philosophers to have PhDs were Marx and Nietzsche. <laughs> <laughs> I think we have time for one more question. Uh, Tevi, right here in the front. You can give him the microphone. <laughs> yeah. Now that's an honor. Thank you. So I'm a historian, and I talked about the historical origins of the term neoconservatism, and I agree that the term has lost most, most of its meaning today. But you guys are political philosophers. How would you characterize Midge Dector's philosophy? What would you uh, name it as? I think that um, 
as as she presented herself, she was really a, a conservative um, without without qualification. Um, and in addition to her own uh, description, I, I think of a remark of Roger Scruton's somewhere, where he says um, the the job of uh, the conservative is to give reasons for things that don't have to be, have to be defended, or something something like that. Um, and I think that she was also um, in in that in that mold. And as I've suggested, I, I think there is um, inspiration in that, and I'm engaged in self-criticism here, not only criticism, implied criticism of, of others, not to get too hung up um, on either specific arguments about policy or abstract philosophical, uh, philosophical distinctions. That's not where the heart of her conservatism or, or I think any uh, effective conservatism lies. Ben, you want to take a crack at that? Or? Yeah, I, uh, you know, I said earlier in my remarks that uh, uh, Mitch Decker was not a theorist, and I think that's right. But I meant that as a compliment, and um, I think um, she never allowed th theoretical abstractions to get in the way of the truth. You know, the truth that she knew through experience. The truth that I mean, one of her complaints, I think, about academic feminism and uh, the loud, nasty kind that was so prominent in the '60s and '70s was, it was teaching people to ignore their own experience. It was teaching people lies, and therefore fundamentally distorting hearts and minds. And as I try to suggest, I think that is a theoretical contribution. Uh, it is uh, her ability to defend uh, what shouldn't need defending on the old, best of all possible worlds. But we live in a world distorted by ideology, and it takes, um, it, 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 it takes reflection. And it takes more than reflection in the sense of abstraction. It takes an openness to what's before you. And I think that was Mitch Gefter's real gift, to see to be able to describe the way a good writer does what is exactly before us, not only in the perverse ideological movement she's confronted, but just in the lives of ordinary people, where other people saw, you know, bourgeois, suburbanite, nonsense, you know, horrible, miserable people. She saw dignified people living dignified lives, if only they could come to appreciate it. Thanks, Dan. That was wonderful. And it's exactly the time in which I'm supposed to pass the baton to my boss, uh, Dr. Kevin Roberts, who is here to introduce a very special guest. I want you to join me in thanking our discussions today for this panel. Excellent discussion, gentlemen. Nice job, actually. Exceptional job, Mike Gonzalez. How about another round of applause for him? He does such great work. Well, it is an honor to introduce our closing speaker for our conference today, and that is Midge's daughter, Naomi. So please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Imagine the frustration of being a teenage girl whose mother is always right about everything. <laughs> you know, if somebody had told her that Heritage or anybody else would be holding a conference about her, she would have laughed and she would have said, eh. But the fact is, um, it's right that there should be such a conference, and it's right that it should be here, because Heritage and many of the people at Heritage were very dear to her heart. Um, so I want to thank you, everybody who arranged this, also for that amazing photo, which I really, really love. Um, so. 
we can all agree that she had a tremendous impact on ideas and on politics. But I'm here to talk about a different, far more tangible impact on the future. She had 13 grandchildren and 13 great-grandchildren, 14th on the way, and counting. So I thought it would be nice to poll some of those young people and little people to see how they remembered her. So starting with the grandchildren, two of her granddaughters actually mentioned her grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> One of them who said, she didn't rush them. She cooked them the right way with the butter, with all the butter and slowly. <laughs> um, the other one said, I just made her famous grilled cheese sandwich, which reminded me of her. Simple, precise, and comforting. Um, let's see, who else do we have? I will always remember how she made me feel truly seen and wonderful, just as I am. She was perceptive and insightful, gentle and graceful, thoughtful and loving, a wise guide. And I think everybody who knew her has experienced that. Um, she was comfort and warmth and her apartment was a shelter and a launching point for all of us. And then, and here you will see how some acorns don't fall too far from some trees. I loved my grandmother beyond expression and admired her beyond expression. She was wise, witty, implacably courageous, endlessly giving, profound, and possessed of a kindness and Socratic sensitivity towards us. Um, and then I should say, as a mother, she was, a, and a grandmother, and a great-grandmother, she was, as she was in the world, energetic, engaged, interested, um, she could actually have a serious conversation with a five-year-old and really enjoy it. So now we turn to the great-grandchildren. Um, they remember her waiting to greet them with a big hug when they came to her house. They remember her as kind and gentle and loving. Um, and then one of them actually remembers her in a way I think that really sums her up perfectly. This is one of her older great-grandchildren who knew her a little better than some of the others because he lived near her. And here's what he said about her. She was very strong. She was very good at Scrabble and she always had a ready retort. <laughs> um, and I will leave you with this thought from one of her youngest great-grandchildren, and I think it's something we can all agree with. I like her, but I haven't seen her in a while. So thank you. Naomi, thank you. I don't think we've had a better speech ever delivered on this stage. So no, I mean that. It, it's really important in the world of policy and ideas and sometimes politics, which are out there outside heritage, proximate to what we do, to remember the humanity of people. 
and the humanity of every person because of their dignity, which your mom knew well and inspired people who never met her is profound. So thank you for that. Thanks for your presence here. Thank you. With that, we're going to move into a reception right outside in the foyer. Thanks for being part of this and God bless you. God bless America.